we're gonna get started. I, I think we might get a few more people coming in, but we wanna be mindful of everyone's time. So if you're here for theology of the body, you're in the right place. If you're not, uh, you're welcome to stay, but uh, hopefully you can find your way uh, <laughs> to the workshop you were looking for. <laughs> So um, we're going to start off with some quick introductions. So who am I? Well, I'm Sue Ann Shaw, and I'm um, Taiwanese American artist and like kind of like aspiring theologian and writer and filmmaker. I do a lot of random crap. So <laughs> some of you know me from my memes on Twitter and <laughs> or other random things I do. Uh, currently, I'm pursuing my Master's of Arts in Musicology at National Taiwan University, so I came all the way from Taiwan to be here with all of you. I'm really, really uh, thankful and really glad I get to be here. And uh, my next question is kind of, who are you and who's in the room? So, uh, who here is a first-timer? I'm so glad you're here. All right. Um, who here is from the South? Ooh. <laughs> All right, who came from the like the northeast? Okay, Midwest. Woo! Oh, a lot of Midwesterners. They love their Florida. Um, <laughs> I know I'm from Michigan. So <laughs> okay, West Coasters. Any? Oh, oh yeah, nice. Cool, cool, cool. Um, great. Well, I'm kind of curious. Y'all can just shout out if you're comfortable. Why you decided to come here? Uh, so did why did some of you decide to come to this workshop? You're Taiwanese, hey. <laughs> My friends came when they're cool, so. Very good reason. Peer pressure. <laughs> super nerdy and deep. You're nerdy and deep. Me too. I'm, I'm really glad that you're here. I'm learning how to stop hating myself and God helps. Yes. Yes. That's a great reason to be here. I think we should. We can all embrace that. Uh, anybody else? Any reasons why you decided to come today? Because you're a magical human. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Emily. Emily's one of the reasons I was able to be here. She helped donate money so I could buy my plane ticket. Because um, <laughs> this is a community, right? And we all take care of each other. So, um, so the next question that is kind of the like the foundation to what we're going to talk about today is what is your spiritual relationship to your body? And I've talked to so many Christians, especially in the United States, but also in Taiwan where I live and I am doing a lot of field work. And a lot of my friends talk about, especially queer Christians or people of color, talking about being taught to hate your body as a Christian. Growing up, you would hear that the body was evil, right? And that you had to deny yourself, you had to deny your body. I think so many of my LGBT Christian friends, um, their queerness, whether it was something to do with their gender or something to do with their sexuality, was seen as something that was in their body and that their spirit was something they needed to overcome that and they need to suppress the body in order to enlighten the spirit, right? So it's from that kind of background here in the United States that's very body phobic. Uh, if we look at, I mean, in some ways we're obsessed with, but also afraid of bodies. Um, something that's been really helpful for my personal spiritual journey and also my own just day-to-day -day life is to think about fat phobia, right? So um, I had like the, I've read a couple of books. There was one called Fat Girl. There is another one. I, I attended a, a workshop in Detroit one time that kind of talked about it, about the process of coming out as a fat person. And it's like, no, it's like, no you're not fat. I don't think of you as fat. You're just my friend. <laughs> it's kind of similar to people like, I don't think of you as gay. You're just my friend, right? And it's part of something that's in your body. It's part of the reality of every day you walk. But somehow, it's a refusal to be a part of the conversation. Right? Because it's seen as something that's queer because it's different. Because queer is originally used as something that's different, right? Or strange. Uh, something that deviates from the norm. And so um, there's what often happens is it's not so much uh, just the hatred of a body, but a denial of the existence of the body. Right? We often think of ourselves as these purely spiritual beings or kind of like floating brains. Our society often kind of like it conceives of people as floating brains. 
And therefore, the implications of our faith is that we think that faith is having a set of beliefs, as, and as opposed to what we're gonna talk about today as an embodied faith, as a practice of life and embodiment. So, um, so I'm gonna continue our introduction, what is the methodology we're going to use in some of our uh, process of decolonization today. And um, something, the reason why this is important to me is that we've often championed one specific strain of Christianity, which is European Western Christianity, which was used to colonize the world. And it was under that guise that of colonization that we also used missions. And what happened is, is in this process of, sorry, in this process of conquering, uh, we also use Christianity to justify our means. And Christianity, when it's being used to conquer, is going to inherently be changed theologically and also in practice, because it's hard to separate what is a what is the thing that we're trying to conquer and what is the thing that is trying to free people, right? So this has been really important for me uh, as an Asian American, as somebody who doesn't come from a, a Christian culture, my family's not Christian, is in my community sometimes people becoming Christian would be seen as becoming more white, right? And for me, it was a really important process to learn what it meant to be a Christian, and that didn't mean I became more white, but it actually meant I could be more Taiwanese, I could be more Chinese, and I could see the glorified, sanctified version of my community, my culture, right? Glorified through God. So to do that, we're going to talk about examining cultures that are not European, Western. Uh, we're also going to look at history and how the different philo philosophical, theological movements have changed and affected Christianity. Uh, and we're also going to kind of like pedal down these trails of embodied knowledge. So um, oftentimes what we associate knowledge purely with intellectual knowledge. Sometimes we think it's like the things you read or you write down on a page. But we all have embodied knowledge. If any of you have ever done sports, you realize like you can think I'm going to put the, the ball in the hoop, but that doesn't mean your body will actually necessarily put the ball in the hoop. Um, one of my favorite jokes about this is from How I Met Your Mother, where Barney is like, huh, anyone can run a marathon. You don't need to train to run a marathon. There's only two steps to running a marathon. One, start running. Two, don't stop. <laughs> <laughs> I think that most of us can confront the absurdity of thinking, I don't, I can know, I'll just tell myself to not, just to not stop, and I, I can run a marathon. <laughs> as opposed to realizing I have to do some sort of training and I, my body has to learn a new kind of knowledge, a new way of being, right? Um, and so uh, one of the other examples I gave to somebody most recently was uh, different ways of cooking. So in you know, Anglo-Western cultures, oftentimes people write down recipes, right? And it's like, this is how you do it. You put like a quarter cup of this and a teaspoon of this and you dash of this. And then um, in my family, we never wrote down recipes. <laughs> I just made the thing with my mom again and again and again and again. I tasted the food, I knew how it tasted, and then some, one day I just knew how to make, make the food. That is an example of an embodied knowledge, right? And what we're going to be talking about as this session goes on is gonna talk about some of the tensions between a knowledge that is purely like intellectual in the way that people like to fathom that it is, because for instance, have you ever made a recipe and then you're like, I don't know if this tastes right, but I followed the recipe perfectly. <clears throat> but you wouldn't know that there was something wrong until you tasted the food. I think that that speaks to our life as queer Christians, that we followed the recipe perfectly, but it didn't taste right. <laughs> it was only through using our senses, using our body, that somehow something clicked, like there's something wrong here. But when we try to talk to people about it, they're like, no, you can't trust it, that's your body, right? And it's like, but I'm tasting, it doesn't taste right. <laughs> no, because you're following the recipe perfectly. So I don't think that embodied knowledge and intellectual knowledge need to be at odds. I think that they're actually very helpful and they can inform one another. But when you say one is the right kind of knowledge and one is the wrong kind of knowledge, you're creating a really false and harmful dichotomy that will then ultimately lead to some really bad tasting food. All right, so as we talked about, this concept contemporarily, body is evil, the spirit is good. 
These arguments are often used against women, people of color, and queer people. So have you ever heard people say that women are irrational and emotional, and therefore they can't make decisions? So why, why is rationality seen as something that is valuable or more trustworthy? Why are emotions seen as untrustworthy? Uh, and for people of color, we often see this in white people saying people of color are savages or they're uncivilized or uneducated, right? They're ignorant, they're foolish. Um, I study musicology and I look at a lot of different cultures and the way that different kinds of music in different cultures has been interpreted particularly by like white Europeans. And they would often argue black music is savage because you like feel the beats in your body, right? And then that makes it evil, as opposed to like enlightened classical music, which you only can understand through analyzing music theory, which is a purely intellectual process, right? So this is the thing that comes up a lot in my, my graduate studies. So uh, this, sometimes people talk about it as like the man versus the beast, right? And they think of like emotions, they think of the body as being animalistic. The other thing that I'm sure many of you here have heard before is that queer people aren't interested in living in the spirit, but by the lust of their bodies, right? So some things that we need to confront from these ideas that we've been given for a really long time. One is a myth of neutrality or objectivity. Has anyone ever told you, oh, what you're saying, that's not objective, so your opinion doesn't matter, because you're, you're subjective. Has anybody ever experienced that? <laughs> I've experienced that too. Yeah, and part of that is that, you ever notice like who, who gets to be objective? It's often a man, he's often straight, he's often uh, able-bodied, right? So that affects this idea that there is a pure human that is purely rational, that doesn't come up and or with against any sort of bias or subjectivity, which is always connected to the body. So in some ways, there are one kind of body that is seen as the objective, normal body. And everybody else is seen as a subjective view that's different, like an add-on. Kind of like uh, if you're playing video games and you have a character and you can like add on features to them. It's like, well, the, if the norm that you get with the character originally is like a male, straight, white man, it's like I can add on a sexuality feature. I can add on like, you know, like a color feature, but it starts from this normal thing and everything after that, it changes what that norm is, right? So uh, next step what we're gonna do is kind of look into how do we arrive at a lot of these similar kinds of understandings. Oh, actually, I have one part I really want to share. Um, I was studying something for school recently, and we were reading about the issue with the, the concept of the rational frontal brain. Have you guys ever, like, the front, front brain is, like, where you make your decisions and you're rational, and then you have, like, your amygdala, and that, like, is your emotions and, like, all that. Well, what happens is they've studied people who've been in had traumatic brain injuries. And if their emotional parts of their brain are damaged, they're not able to make rational decisions. So it doesn't matter that you're, is there a problem? Okay, carry on. Um, <laughs> so uh, that's an example of how we think, oh, if I just leave emotions out of something, I can make a really level-headed rational decision. But everything we know, everything that is rational is always connected to our body and to our emotional state. And if we took that, piece out of the equation, we actually wouldn't really be able to make whole thoughtful decisions. So history in reverse. Um, as I was trying to figure out where did kind of like Western European culture come up with this, something kept coming coming up in, in the verbiage and the kind of logic of a lot of people. So uh, for those of you who may or may not know the brief history of Christianity, um, you know, for a thousand some years, the church was mostly Catholic, either Roman Catholic or Eastern Catholic, or we often call them Eastern Orthodox. And then um, the Reformation happened, and Martin Luther, and the feces, and the knocking on the door of Wittenberg, right? So, <laughs> and we often, I mean, at least for me growing up in, you know, America in public school, it was taught that this period of Reformation, it was connected to the Renaissance, and then the Enlightenment. So these periods of time, where art and science and 
you know, rational thinking were because they were all stupid and primitive during the Middle Ages. That was kind of what I was taught. Uh, they didn't read books and people, you know, just trusted the church and all this stuff. So, um, you know, they're like, this is a championing critical thinking, which I love critical thinking. But there is the, these ideas that start to come up about rationality and trusting um, the scientific method. So, um, you know, for those of you who may or may not remember from school, scientific method is a specific way of figuring out and knowing certain things, right? So it's a method to define and create, a, create knowledge. If you examine the liturgical differences between Christian communities of these times and how they're reflected with their beliefs, for instance, um, something I've noticed is in like Baptist, evangelical, more like Reformation-oriented churches, they tend to have really long sermons, like 40 minutes. But if you go to like an English church or like a Catholic church, their homilies are like 10 minutes, <laughs> right? And so you can kind of see how there's an emphasis on certain values over others. One is like, you really gotta know this stuff and I'm gonna give you a bullet point list and you gotta know all these things and that's how you'll be the best Christian ever is if you know everything, right? And another version says, I want you to eat this, I want you to smell this, I want you to feel these things uh, and communicates using a different kind of practice. Now, I'm gonna be real, I'm a Presbyterian. I love a good sermon, <laughs> but I also love worship, and I love music, right? I, uh, I know a lot of people are like, oh, I don't like it when the worship gets too emotional, because then I feel like I'm losing control, right? And I know so many people are like, I love it when I worship and it's so emotional, I'm losing control. <laughs> the two different ways of looking at what your relationship with your body and what you associate sometimes with good and sometimes with bad. So we were talking about embodied faith, and I just wanted to, uh, to share these two Bible verses that I thought of when I was working on my presentation. Now faith is a substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Hebrews 11.1. 1. And then from James 2.14-19. <coughs> what does it profit, my brethren? If someone says he has faith but does not have works, can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to him, depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you did not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? That's also faith by itself. It does not have works. It is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that there is one God. You do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. I think I often thought of faith as an abstract, floaty principle. And as I actually started to study the Bible more, because I think that's how people talk about faith. That instead of faith as something you can do with your body, that it has substance, right? As we continue in our history in reverse, uh, a big part of the Enlightenment period, a big part of the Reformation was the influence from Greek philosophers. So this is often known as a neoclassical period. So they thought of like the Greek, Greco, Roman stuff as classical. So this is the new, neo means new classical. So uh, if you often wonder, if you look at art from that period, you're like, wait, what? I thought this is from the 1600s, 1500s, 1800s. Why does it look like a bunch of Greek and Roman statues? It's because they were influenced by the art of that time and the ideas and the thinking. So a lot of the leaders of the Reformation, Martin, Luther, and Calvin, and Knox, a lot of them were reading Greek philosophers, and that was really influencing the way that they interpreted the Bible. Now, I'm not saying that Greek philosophy is useless and without help. I think it's thoughtful and I think it's helpful, but I think if you rely too heavily on using one perspective to understand everything, then you, get, you can get really pulled away. So one of the things that's prevalent in a lot of that era of Hellenistic philosophy um, is Gnosticism and also this, du this dualism of the body and the mind, or the spirit, as, as separate from the body. So I don't know about y'all, but I was a teenager when the Da Vinci Code was really, really big. <laughs> And I remember my pastors teaching us a lot about apologetics during time, and especially about 
Gnosticism and like the Gnostic Gospels. Anyone remember that stuff? <laughs> so, does anyone remember what was one of the core beliefs of Gnosticism? The bodies were bad and the spirit was good. So part of it, if you read the Gnostic Gospels, is they don't think that Jesus was actually di actually died. Because how could God, someone so enlightened, allow their body to be treated in such a way? Like, um, how could even Jesus have, how could God have a body, right? Um, and so a lot of what our beliefs are about sex, a lot of our beliefs about, like, sexuality are, are very influenced by Augustine of Hippo. And he, before he became a Christian, was a Neoplatonist, so Platon, like, like Plato. <laughs> he was really, he, you can see how he carried a lot of his beliefs about <coughs> the body being bad, about sex being bad into his Christianity, and how that's affected us today, right? So we're talking about Greek culture, but what does that say of Jesus' Jewishness, right? Um, I think a uh, pastor from Fuller, he, uh, Daniel Lee, he po pointed something out to me a few years ago. He said, um, why was it important that Jesus was Jewish? And how come we don't, how come we have a weird relationship with that? Was it necessary for Jesus to be Jewish in order, you know, to all these things? Um, and I had a friend recently from China who's a classmate of mine. He's like, why do Christians hate Jews? Wasn't Jesus a Jew? And I was, ta I tried to give him like a really brief history of 2,000 years. <laughs> and I said, well, you know, the early church was mostly Jewish people, right? And, but at some point there was a really big change where, especially when the Roman government, the empire, decided to make Christianity their state religion. Now, if you're looking for who to blame, as to say, who killed Jesus? You know, in the early church, when it's Jews, they're gonna say, Rome and Caesar killed Jesus, and the Roman Empire, this empire is our enemy. But as the Roman Empire became the propagator of Christianity, they're not gonna say, oh, we were the people who killed Jesus, and we're the enemy. They're going to switch that and start to blame the Jewish people instead, who are the originators of this community. And it's been really helpful for me to think about and to uh, address, like listen to a lot of Jewish theology. I listen to some Jewish podcasts. Um, some of, one of my best friends, um, who is a Christian, but it's weird. It, her father really tried to erase their Jewishness when they became Christians. But anyway, a lot of the culture kind of persisted. And um, and I, I do think, like, uh, oftentimes people like to joke Jewish culture and Chinese culture have a lot of things in common. Um, and a big part of that is, like, caring for people's needs in the body and, oh, you know, like, eat some more food and, and things like that, um, a kind of, like, a embodiedness. So I think that uh, it's really fascinating to think about how Christianity and imbibing a lot of Hellenistic Greek philosophy um, has change culturally, especially in, in no longer reflecting uh, a lot of practices of Judaism. Um, to get into this next part, so um, my personal experiences as someone who's Taiwanese, Chinese, American has caused me to reflect on my culture and ways that my culture didn't often fit in with European American mainstream culture, but also with uh, like Western Christianity. So. Um, I personally, in my experiences, have always felt very embodied in that my, my body, my mind, my spirit has been very unified, and I think part of it was growing up in a, in a non-Christian household, <laughs> and then taking a whole person into Christianity and trying to figure out how to live those things unified together. Um, and, and as I've continued in Christian community, I've seen a lot of my friends struggle to, to do that. It's been really hard for them. and. Um, the way I often talk about it as if surgery, as if you cut off a piece of your body and then you're trying to sew it back together. It's a lot harder to do that um, than to maybe be a person who has some things that need to be patched up and fixed, but it's not an entire limb needing to be re So um, I'm just gonna do a quick, some basics of, you know, uh, some East Asian philosophy. So Confucianism, Taoism um, are both 
kind of like teachings that are very influential, particularly in East Asia and, and in some places in Southeast Asia. Um, and as I've been studying in Taiwan, I've been able to, to learn more about some of this. So there's a different kind of dualism. Chinese dualism is really different from Greek dualism in that there are two things, but they, they are informed by and they know one another. So, um, so there, I have a couple of phrases up here that are examples of um, binaries or dualism that exists in Chinese culture. Uh, what is yin yang? So many, some of you might have heard of like yin yang. <laughs> um, that's kind of what that is, but it's pronounced yin yang. And it's uh, the moon and the sun. And it's also a, a depiction of lots of different forces, masculinity, femininity, darkness, light. Um, and you can see how in this yin yang like symbol, how the white is in the black and the black is within the white. And part of that is that yin and yang are together and they're informed by each other, right? Um, something that was really, really big on gender that I noticed is that in um, like my Chinese and Taiwanese communities, masculinity and femininity are seen as coexisting in each human being. Um, so we all have some yin, we all have some yang, and some people have more or less, but it's pretty normal to not be totally yin or totally yang. And it's actually expected, and in Taoist philosophy, it's very unhealthy to only have one, right? Um, but when I was in understanding gender, femininity, and masculinity in a Western culture, people were like, well, if I'm a woman, then I'm supposed to be all feminine and I can't express any sort of masculinity. Or if I'm a man, I, I have to, I can't, I have to eschew anything that I perceive as femininity. And in the picture, the normative of health is seen as having not only one and none of the other. Um, to me, this was really difficult because I was trying to figure out, I thought everybody has, a, has yin and yang. Everyone has masculinity and femininity in them. And that's normal and that's natural and that's healthy. And then I was kind of like, oh wait, I'm in a culture that uses similar words but has a totally different set of standards. I think that most people can acknowledge there's parts of me that feel more feminine, parts of me that feel more masculine. They're not at war with each other. They're actually united here in my body, right? Um, the other thing is sen shin. So sen is a word for body, shin is the word for heart or also for mind. So sometimes it's confusing because psychology in Chinese is like, is uh, xing li shi, which is like the things inside my heart study. The things that study, I study inside my heart. And I was like, wait, 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 how do you separate cardiology from psychology? Because you use the same word to describe the, like, the physical heart, but also the mind. And I thought that was so fascinating, that emotion, right, was, this, was synonymous with mind in Chinese language, right? And that you can't separate the, the emotion from the mind, which we were kind of talking about earlier, literally with your brain function, right? Um, and then the other thing is tian di, di, which is sky and earth. Um, and sky is often also the word for heaven, so heaven and earth. He yi. Um, so the body, sen xing, he yi, tian di he yi, tian ren he yi. Um, it's about the unity, the bringing together of your body and your mind, of heaven and earth together. And that this is seen as the epitome, that all these things will come together and be united. And that's, in some ways, the most enlightened spiritual form of worship and also heaven, right? So... A lot of Chinese philosophy, art, and medicine assumes this direct connection between the body and the mind. And, uh, and this is a really holistic approach to understanding, for instance, like chronic pain um, and how that's connected to mental health, right? And, uh, and I think for a lot of us who've experienced trauma and PTSD, uh, religious trauma syndrome, um, we've seen how our, our mental state, our anxiety has manifested into hot rashes, highs. I personally like threw up, I had panic attacks. The body and the mind are connected, right? And to pretend that we can separate mental health from physical health is in fact an, is an illusion unto ourselves. So knowing this, how can this help us understand the Bible better? And how can this help us to understand what the Trinity is, right? Things that are different and separated, but also united together in one. I think that the, the Trinity is a mystery that escapes the rational, philosophical, enlightenment brain. There's three, but they're one. <laughs> doesn't really make sense. And I think part of it is it doesn't really make sense, but that it's an embodied truth. 
that many of us have come to understand but not necessarily be, been able to explain. I, this next slide is kind of weird. It's a really terrible Google Translate of um, an article that I read for school. Uh, and the words are really small because it's a kind of long thing. But um, to talk, it kind of talks about yin and yang and how, the, for instance, the yang side is more yang and less, but then also the yin side is more yin and less. According to the principle of to be balanced, more convenient is, is naturally required to flow to fewer parties. The lesser ones need to be accepted from more than one party. I will give you more, and you will give me more. To achieve balance, coordination, and harmony between the two parties. In that to say, we can't understand what it means to be a man without understanding what it means to be a woman. And in in understanding this, it, it's a different way of understanding gender and the differences that we have and how none of us has to fully embody an, a, like one concept of ultimate masculinity or ultimate femininity and that it's actually healthy for us for these things to be together. Um, so what, is the, what are the consequences, results, and conclusions that we can derive from the, what, how disembodiment has played on our faith, spiritually. So the thing I always go back to in this is, how do we understand the concept of the incarnation of God in Jesus Christ as perfect divinity in humanity, right? Jesus is fully God, fully human, and took on flesh. It, in order for Jesus to complete his work, he had to become human, right? He experienced physical things in his body, temptation, human limitations, hunger, exhaustion, thirst. He experienced emotions. I think if we look to Jesus, we can see how the, having a body, being an embodied being, feeling things, having limitations, that's not what it means. That's not a barrier to being a person of faith or a Christian, right? To deny oneself, right? It's actually, I think fasting is a really interesting experience. We can use fasting to say, oh, I don't need my body and I can be above it. And I, but then like hour 10 hits you and you're like, I am a person with a body and I have limitations and I'm hungry. But it's actually in that hunger and our limitation, it reminds us of how much we need, how much, and it can, it can be an opportunity to be grateful for the fact that God provides for us as opposed to an attempt to transcend the needs of the body. Fasting is about transcending the needs of the body. It's actually about confronting the needs of our body to, to, to point us back to God. Also, we talked earlier about dying a human death and what that means that Jesus' body literally died and how in many ways that would be seen as something unclean or unholy in a lot of cultures and a lot of religions. And that's something that kind of brings me back to Jesus, is that Jesus looks at the body and says, this is not only, like, it's necessary, it's good, and it is beautiful, right? We looked at Jesus' glorified body after his resurrection. Uh, he still has his scars and the holes in his hand. And this idea of a glorified body being made perfect, I mean, we think, I, I used to think, oh, when I get to heaven, I'll be skinny, and I won't have wrinkles or pimples and my hair will never be frizzy. But if I look at <laughs> but if I look at Jesus and his glorified resurrected body, it gives me a really different picture of what how God often redeems and glorifies the parts of the body that I think I have shame for. Right? And in the in the verse that we've been using for the Great Communion, talking about the necessity of the whole body together, right? And how there are things that are we are ashamed of that are actually where God shows his glory most. If Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty and your faith is also empty. If Jesus' body, his physical body, was not resurrected, we're all kind of kidding ourselves. So if you think that your spiritual walk and your body do not matter to God, you are kidding yourself. <laughs> To go on, there are lots of social, political, and also issues with medical science. So an argument I hear a lot for people arguing against LGBT people is saying, you put your identity in your sexuality, right? 
And I think in some ways it's saying you put your identity in your body when you should put your identity in your spirit. This is often, I also hear this about race and about culture, culture background. Oh, I don't see you as an Asian person, I see you as a person. It's like, well, I am Asian and God made me Asian, so maybe you should, you know, think about how God glorifies me in that way, right? God made me bisexual. How is God glorified through my body as a bisexual woman? I think that um, what has been really helpful and really um, enlightening, I hate to use that word, for me, <laughs> is to think about the history of the transatlantic slave trade in the way that that changed Christianity. They had to change how they believed and what they believed about the Bible in order to justify slavery. So one of the biggest things I often hear is like, oh, they're better off because they became Christians and therefore it's okay. Like, we helped these slaves by teaching them about Jesus. And to me, that is a separation between the mind and the body by saying, it's okay for me to enslave their body as long as I free their mind or I free their spirit. As opposed to thinking maybe God, God's goal is to experience physical and spiritual liberation and how those are inherently connected to each other. I mean, when we look at the book of Exodus, right? God wants the Israelites to know him, to have a spiritual communion with him, to worship him. That is what we would call spiritual liberation. But God never does that without also saying, I will give you physical liberation from your slavery as well. What, the, what happens on earth to the body doesn't, the, I think that like this is part of the working backwards thing. We're understanding how do we get to this place where we say the body doesn't matter? It's because we had to justify certain atrocities in slavery and colonization in order to get to this place. And now it's led to all these you know how like a good tree bears good fruit and then a bad tree bears bad fruit? Well, this bad tree bore a lot of bad fruit and then those that fruit had more babies, you know, like, and there's more bad fruit. I feel like this is kind of like a second, third generation of bad fruit. I think a lot of this, this last point about the medical aspect is that I think a lot of us have experienced this. The mind-body-spirit connection is closely related to our trauma experiences. And it's not, like I said, it's not enough to just treat one or the other, but they're united together. I think a lot of people have realized, like, oh, if I drink more than one cup of coffee a day, then my anxiety gets worse. Like, like my anxiety isn't something that only exists in my brain. It's something that exists in my body, yes. right? So for us to heal, what does it mean for us to heal, to go from here, to try and create the world? As Duray was saying, that the trauma never has to happen. We have to try and live as fully embodied beings to not see the mind and the body and the spirit as separate things, but as when I'm caring for someone's body, I am caring for their spirit. And when I'm caring for someone's spiritual life, I'm also caring for their emotional and bodily well-being. So my last slide here is some discussion questions for you, but you can also ask me if you have any questions you want to ask, but what does it mean to be embodied and what is embodied solidarity? So something I, I realized a long time ago, so I, I was side B for a very long time, um, for most of my experience as a gay Christian. And I often felt like people, some other gay people, I couldn't tell them that I was pursuing celibacy because I felt like they might think I, they were, like I was trying to change them or um, they might feel threatened by me in some sort of way. Um, but the reality is I had more in common with other gay people that I did with straight people who necessarily agree with me theologically. Because um, I was suffering in the same way that, that, that they were. My body was experiencing the same pain and the same trauma that they were. I think that straight Christians I meet, especially the non-affirming ones, they tend to think that they have more in common with people who share their theology than people who share their bodies. You know, um, I can pretend all day that I'm not like other Asians and I don't want to hang out with them, but at the end of the day, if a racist wants to call me a slur and beat me up, I won't be like, but I'm one of the good ones. <laughs> like, <laughs> right? But sometimes we, I think we live in a world where we like to define people most by what they believe and what they think and their theological positions. But our day-to-day -day experiences, our embodied experience, actually help us to share more with people who might not think the same things we do, but live in a similar social position of marginalization that we do. And um, and when I talk to, you know, 
I'm a performer for me now, but when I talk to a lot of my siblings that are side B, you know, I can feel and I can hear in their voice. They know what I know, and they're experiencing what I'm experiencing. And that makes my conversations with them extremely different from non-affirming people who are straight, right? To me, this is what I'm saying, that they are my sibling, right? They share in the burden in their body with me. And when we make our, our lines and when we make our, what we think that matters most to us only about our abstract intellectual beliefs, we miss the fact that, um, that we will all suffer together physically, no matter what you end up believing. So this is, I think, part of embodied solidarity is pointing out to people who might think they're different because they think different things that at the end of the day, they're gonna send us to the concentration camp too. We're all going in the same truck together. Even if, you know, you think you can convince somebody you're one of the good ones. Um, history has shown they will not, they will judge you by your body and send you off elsewhere. The next question I have for this is what does it then mean to be a part of the body of Christ? I think about this all the time. If there is a part of your body that you can no longer feel, that you can no longer have sensation, if you, if you were, if, if I could no, if I, let's say like I lost all the feeling in my leg and then like someone crushed it or stabbed it or like burned it, how, that's, the pain that my, my, my leg is still feeling that pain, but the rest of my body isn't necessarily conscious of that. That's what I think it's like to be an LGBT Christian, is that we're a part of this body, but they're so numb to everything, they don't realize that their own bo they're setting their own body on fire and burning it. To be in a body means that you can feel the pain. And what does it mean for us to be together, to be unified? and to weep with those who weep and mourn with those who mourn and also to celebrate with those who celebrate and have joy. It means to share in that together and that's part of what it means to be a body, right? Um, there's so much stuff in the Bible, I wish I could talk for a super long time about it, but I, I think that um, I've kind of given you an idea today about what does it mean for our faith to be embodied, for our actions to reflect our beliefs and also for us to realize that our, our bodies are telling truths that maybe our brains haven't caught up to yet. Um, I think that's all I'm gonna do for today, but if y'all have any questions, if you have any thoughts you'd love to share, I'd love to hear that. For sure. And I'm curious, maybe you can reflect um, about the physical experiences you had in your Catholic upbringing, the smells and the tastes, and how that was a part of you knowing God as well. I feel it was a little more, like you said, it's not a little more sterile. It was more of like kind of the denial of the body, mm -hmm. you know, don't do things. It was always about don't do, don't do things. Versus do something, right? There's yeah, communion doesn't taste very, very, those wafers are really gross. <laughs> My, my, my old church in Nashville, we would make the bread every week, um, and uh, it tasted so good, we would all, like, eat the communion bread. I think that's like, how, you know, not, uh, not um, what's the word I'm looking for? Gluttony for the peace of God, but you know, a true hunger for the, to taste and see that God is good. <laughs> to experience it. Yes, to experience and, that, and that's where I think that sexuality is important too, is, you know, I,
Yes. And I think that a really important part is to remember that the mind and the body have to work together always. So if you only ever ate the things that you immediately wanted, you would be very unhealthy. I mean, I, I would be, and you would probably be very unhealthy. And so it's good that we do have higher brain function sometimes to be like, no, it's better for you to wait a little bit to eat dinner than to eat this candy right now. I'm, I'm thinking of talking to my three-year-old nephew. Um, <laughs> but it's like, you know, um, but at the same time, to never feed your body to say, I don't need that either, is really unhealthy. So we need these things to inform one another to be in health. And God made us as physical and spiritual and emotional thinking beings. Our, our, our critical thinking has to work together with our body and with our emotions in order to, to as opposed, I think sometimes people are like, the brain has to, like, the body has to submit to the brain, right? And this is very similar to the patriarchal model we see where it's like, women must submit to men. And that is how God designed it to work. As opposed to thinking, we must submit to each other. We must all, we must all submit to one another in order to be healthy. The body, the, the, body, the, the mind and the body, they must submit to each other, right? As opposed to one having lordship over the other. How do we define healthy? I think that that is, a, I, I could answer that question in a very long way. I'll do my best to answer it in a short way. Um, I think that for a lot of us, we have to reimagine what health looks like. Because um, what has been told us was healthy is oftentimes actually unhealthy in a form of pain and illness. And we don't even realize that until we actually listen to our body. So, um, for instance, this archetype of like one man, one woman, woman and the, de the perfect domestic nuclear family 50s style. They were told, we were told that is the epitome of healthiness. We know so many people who had exactly that kind of family, they were not healthy, right? Go to church on every Sunday, have two cars, everything perfect, not healthy. That was what we were told was healthy. Even today in our modern medical system, the BMI system was designed by a eugenics man, and it was, he sampled a bunch of like white people from like maybe I think it was Denmark, and then he said this is what the optimal body weight is for each height. It actually doesn't reflect any medical evidence of what is healthy and what isn't. So for you, your healthy weight weight might be a little bit lower, it might be a little bit higher than what the BMI range tells you to be. But you'll only know that from living your life and being like, oh, well, when I'm alone, when I'm, I can tell I'm don't have enough energy, I'm not eating enough food, or I'm really, you know, like my period is off. That often is an example of like, uh, for, for people with ovaries, uh, <laughs> that like you're not eating enough or you're, or you're having too much stress in your life. Like those are things you have to pay attention to as opposed to saying, I've hit this weight and therefore I'm healthy. Like, every person would raise their hand. I think like that was a really big cultural difference between 
some, you know, at least like some Chinese Christian communities. I mean, a lot of Chinese immigrant communities and people who have really close relationships with Western Christianity, they also internalize those beliefs. But at least for me, as somebody who grew up Chinese, not in a Christian context, I was never taught to hate my body. Um, with his embodiment. He's a gay Christian. 
And he told me that he was going to work out a bunch because he wanted to feel really strong and to also have men thirst after him. And I told him that he was like, I want to feel in my body. And I was like, oh, this is actually the best way for you to feel your body is to want to feel like you can try and look for other people. Right? And I think I need to be really careful because sometimes we want to use the body to dominate other people too. And that is actually a spiritual, a, a desire for spirituals, like we are talking about submission, power, worship. Uh, as opposed to a submission, right? So um, I think we're about out of time, but I'm really thankful that all of you came here today. And if you want to stay in touch with me, um, y'all heard I do a lot of Twitter, not as much as before, and I'm on Instagram, same handle right there. Um, feel free to message me, uh, add me on Facebook, email me. It's just my name, Suanne.shaw at gmail.com. All right. <laughs>